Hey everyone, welcome to another episode of Spending Time. I'm David Brennan and I'm once again joined by Zach. Hey Zach, how's it going? Cheers fam. David, thanks for having me. Glad to be here. So in this episode, we're going to be talking about watch advertising and marketing in the watch industry a little bit. Here's a selection of, of pictures and watch advertisements that I've gathered over the years. These are not all of them, but these are some pretty good ones from from all types of eras in the in the watch industry, 1930s and 50s, you know, the good times and then the not so good times in the <laughs> 70s and 80s when things were going down and then the crazy days started in the in the late 80s and early 90s and from then on we actually ended up with Anna Kournikova just melting down from a chair <laughs> dreaming about wearing an Omega. So for you guys who are listening to the podcast, we will also, you, you, as an audio, we will also describe the pictures that we are looking at a little bit. So it's it's a show and tell <laughs> kind of thing. Um, so yeah, basically, the point where I would like to begin is just can you imagine the watch in this room, watches in general, uh, I mean luxury watches, uh, without marketing at all? Just, no. just imagine that, that, yeah, right? It's, it's such That's an impossible. essential element. Well, and, and not only is it an essential element, I mean, it, as watches become progressively less... Uh, less crucial, less important to the daily life, it becomes more important um, that they are marketed as like aspirational objects. And I think that's what's what's really interesting about the timeline um, that you've kind of put together here. Because it, it literally, I mean, it literally starts, I'm looking at this 1903 Elgin advertisement of a pocket watch uh, sitting on a sundial. <laughs> on a sundial. Right. From 1903, uh, you know, saying that this uh, this pocket watch is as accurate or as as quote unquote sure as the sun, um, and you know, and that's from an era when when timekeeping this was this was it was crucial that you had a watch that was accurate. And then when you go up to that, I think that was Nicole Kidman that uh, that image of her that Omega ad where you know it's no longer a necessary item. I mean that that to me spans like the absolute genesis of 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 what we're talking about here today. <laughs> yeah, that's that's a really good point actually. That the, how far you know we've we've come and how detached we've be, uh, we've become from the original purpose. And it, yeah, you're absolutely correct. The, the 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 importance of marketing just increases the further you you drift away from how essential these products actually are. Yep. So you have to justify. All the expense and all the all all the immense cost and so on. So yeah, finally I found I found this picture that you talked about. Yeah, it's a <laughs> nineteen oh three. Isn't it cute? I think that's really uh, cute. really yeah. cute. Yeah. So basically, yeah, what you said it's it's a sundial, like an actual sundial, um, with a pocket watch laid on top of it, and it says, "Sure as the sun is the Elgin watch, unaffected by <laughs> heat or cold, damp or draught, jar or jolt. Elgin Elgin watches keep accurate time." An illustrated history of the watch sent free. So make sure you email someone yeah, right. or actually email someone at Elgin National Watch Company yeah. in Illinois. That's 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 really cute. And yeah, by contrast, if you look at some of these some of this new stuff, um, um, you will see uh, what you just talked about. So basically, I, what I want to ask people is that you picture this. You're walking around in, in London somewhere on Bond Street and you see a watch store that carries many different luxury brands. And picture the scenario that there is no watch marketing, there is no marketing behind the products, and you just pass by this window and you would see maybe like 30, 40, 50 different watches from four or five different brands. And they would range in price from five to, you know, whatever, eight, ten thousand dollars all the way to thirty or forty, fifty thousand dollars. And you'd have no idea, like none of the marketing messages were in your head. You just saw these watches mm -hmm. that for some reason okay. cost so much more than other watches on the market presently. It would make no sense. You would have no idea why you would want it. At, at least most of the people who buy those you know, tens of millions of watches that the, that the Swiss produce every year, um, I'm reluctant to believe that everyone is a watch enthusiast or a connoisseur who's you know, looking for that anglage or that beautifully made case or something like that. At least a little bit, or I would go out on a limb and say, to a large extent, the marketing and the messaging and all that is a, is a large part of it. Would you agree? Yeah, I, I would. I would absolutely agree. I feel like uh, Jean Claude Biver was was very articulate on this particular issue. He also understood that the necessity of a watch was diminished, uh, you know, especially in this right. era. But um, but he understood that in order to be able to sell watches at these price points, that like marketing was essential to appeal to the the potential customer's emotion. 
these are highly like emotion based objects. And I think I think that's another thing that's interesting about all of these advertisements that we've we've got laid out in front of us where if you look at the timeline it goes from very practical to very emotional from from you know it's kind of just a, a sliding spectrum practical emotional practical emotional. And you can kind of see them getting more and more emotional. I mean the Brightling ones are an interesting example where it goes, you know, adventure and discovery and iconic and you know very very emotion based around that's that's the uh, the one right there um very emotion based around inspiration and around uh you know places that you might want to travel and they're they're a little bit more evocative in that sense but they don't say anything about the actual product itself um and i think i mean i i think really tapping into that was um was was what really brought um I mean that was really successful for for JCB uh, in the the Blanc Pond Renaissance um, when he brought that brand back. So, I mean that was hugely emotion based. I mean looking at yeah. the the, the, With the romance moon phase. of the mechanical watch. Exactly, exactly. Yeah. Uh, the, so so there are a few things here. Um, basically, I think the turning point here was actually the Royal Oak, and, and not just simply because it was the first. It, but but it goes deeper. I, I I was writing this article and I was trying to think it through, and and that's when I really ended up with this with this conclusion. And once you say it, I think it, it sounds it makes sense. But for me, it was it was some sort of a eureka moment. Like you know, of course. But once you <laughs> so once you, once you figure it out. So basically, what happened there, and the key to the success of the Royal Oak was not simply that it was steel, and not simply that it was expensive. The key there was that, and here's the emotional part, and here's the marketing part. Is that it was an instantly recognizable design, so that pe- so this was in my mind the first luxury watch that was decidedly and knowingly overpriced beyond beyond you know any mm-hmm. anything that you could even even vaguely call as justified. Mm-hmm. It was it, justification and royal oak is two different things entirely, and basically the point was that you would wear this, and it was the first watch that would very openly communicate to everyone that you're blatantly rich you know everyone would tell could tell that you bought a watch and i looked it up and it's true the real look actually cost more in steel than the other gold dress watches that ap was making at the time so the message here was that yeah i have all this money to burn and i can just buy another one it's still it has no inherent value that much at least of course it was a nicely made watch don't don't hear don't you know don't get it wrong but the message there was emotional, and it was it was the first really luxury product. It was not a high end tool like the right. watches that used to be until that point, but it was the first stupid expensive luxury product, at least in my mind, or as far as I can tell. And this was in 1972. And that's a very good point too, because that and describing this advertisement a bit for those folks who uh, who might be listening on iTunes, um, you know, there's a it was sort of a blown up shot of the uh, the bevels and the edges of the the bezel. Um, right. And then a paragraph kind of describing it. So I, I feel like it is both appealing to the emotion and, uh, I mean, there's very little practicality here described, but it, it still uses kind of that old school, the, the past generation of, of kind of spelling things out a little bit using a fair amount of text. But the way that it's blocked out using negative space, this text, this oversized image, um, to me, yeah, I agree. This really does represent sort of a transition between the two. And I would wonder, was, and I'm just asking this question out loud, was steel more expensive because AP wanted it to be, or was it more expensive because the tooling back then? I mean, steel obviously being harder than, um, that's uh, a good question. than any of the precious metals at the time. I, I, I would wonder if it was if the tooling just wasn't sophisticated enough to actually manufacture the complexities of this case. Mm, um, gold is, is, is certainly softer than steel, softer. Uh, mm-hmm. quality, yeah. quality stainless steel, and that's exactly what, what this blurb here in, the, in, this, in this ad is saying, that it's, uh, it's what it says, a steel is the metal of the 20th century, more difficult <laughs> to fashion than fine go. gold, and so made infinitely precious by the exquisite quality of the work. Um, so yeah, these are just words, but yeah, that's a really good point. I really genuinely seriously doubt that if you add the, 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 um, you know, how much more expensive it is to work with steel, um, onto the basement, the cost of the base material, it still would not be as expensive yeah. as yeah, the base material really of true. gold. So it was just, it was just stupendously overpriced. I mean, it's you know what? another interesting thing to me about this particular ad is that, um, it addresses, 
uh, it indirectly addresses uh, the customer that they are targeting. Mm-hmm. And I think that was a strategy that, you know, we saw a lot in sort of the, the, the Mad Men era where you are a man of action or yes. you are, uh, you know, you so are this true. or you are that. <laughs> Um, you know, and the modern consumer doesn't like to be put in boxes anymore. And I yeah. think I think that really sort of changed in, what, the late 80s, 90s, maybe even later. Um, Dude, and I think that's that also sort of marked a shift away from a lot of that um, really explicit, like, spelling it out style of marketing where, um, you know. So for you guys who, who can't see this, basically the, the first... Basically, this is what the ad says. It says, Royal Oak, a tribute to steel. Discerning men of action That's are right. no longer satisfied <laughs> with a run-of-the-mill watch. Uh, basically, mm-hmm. they are saying that if you're wearing this watch, you're a discerning man of action. That's right. Always on the move. They demand something more. A perfect timepiece in complete harmony with the multiple activities of their fast-moving lives. Jesus right. Christ. Basically, <laughs> this, this proves that, uh, you know, if you remove the discerning man part... Watch heads are exactly the same yeah. today. You yeah. know, it's, uh, it's true. I mean, that that spells out everything except like describing what their potential customer's stock portfolio looks like. <laughs> everything else <laughs> yes, is exactly. in there. <laughs> it's too um, funny. But, you know, I, to me, like I look at this and it, it really begs the question. Um, okay, so if 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 a brand today is not saying who their customer is because they understand that their customer is a savvy person who does not want to be put in a box. How do you appeal to someone? You know who your target is, but how do you tell them that they are your target without spelling it out like this? And I think I think an interesting way of, of marketing is through like partnerships. I mean, you look at the, the JLC Navy SEALs that you picked up recently. I mean, that to me was a super savvy partnership in that they were they were spelling out who their customer was without actually describing that person through that partnership vis-a-vis. Yeah, though to be fair, that was that, that was a really niche product. That's true. That's true. Here's a good example for um, for you. This Tudor ad from 2010, and it shows the Tudor oh, like this one. <laughs> Chrono. This is a great looking watch, actually. And basically, the watch is put on uh, the, the the side mirror or wing mirror of a, of a vintage race car, and all you see is that you get this idea that this is a race car. Um, and the mirror reflects the 1970 watch, and it's it's written next to it 1970. And then you see the new watch is hanging off the uh, the mirror, and it says 2010. And basically, the message is that the watch stayed pretty much unchanged mm-hmm. Uh, mm-hmm. over this time. So you're saying, do you like racing, and do you like uh, heritage? Uh, here's a watch for you. You know, mm-hmm. and mm-hmm. that's the problem. It's a little bit vague. Like, why should I buy this? Does this do? anything special in terms of like motor racing or whatever it's not a very descriptive ad but it's um it's something it it nicely connects the watch to its past and that's all it does by contrast if you look at this ad from for omega from 1916 it shows (laughs) five eight ten thirteen different watches thirteen watches but then again at the time, you didn't see as many ads. You you were not online. You were not bombarded with so much information. So you would you would presumably have the time to look it all through and look at thirteen different watches. I cannot remember when was the last time I couldn't tell you that I saw uh, a major watch brand advertise thirteen watches at the same time on the same yep. ad. Yep. Isn't that funny? I think that's that's pretty funny. Those are, those are the early days. They were, uh, you know, it's like a it's like a high school or a middle school kid who just discovers Photoshop for the first time, and they just go buck wild. Um, you know, but but I, you know, going back to this Tudor ad, I, you know, it's, I feel like the Tudor ad is actually it's very effective, but to me it feels a little bit lazy. Um, yeah, in in Maybe. a sense that like it it, it definitely tells me exactly everything I need to know about the watch, that it's a racing watch and that it uh, it's it's very faithful to the old version. But to me, I mean, I interpret this ad almost a little bit too literally that like this brand is a little bit too focused on the rear view mirror maybe. Yeah. Um, but That's a but, different topic, but you are right. Yeah, yeah it, it, they really yeah. are. So, yep. Yeah. Yeah. I, I would love I would love to know, and to me, the reason this conversation today got me kind of excited was that um, I'm really interested in in knowing, like, when you look at these ads, which of these ads speaks to you as a as a watch buyer the most? Like, who's who's advertising, or or more generally speaking, what kind of advertising? And I would love to pose this question to our audience as well. Like, what kind of advertising do you actually respond to? Have you ever bought a watch? 
based on an ad that you've seen, vintage or otherwise. I mean, I, I would. Nobody wants to admit it, but like it's worked to some degree. Otherwise, we wouldn't be. I mean, <laughs> none of us, none of us would have jobs in the watch industry if if, if it wasn't advertising, for advertising wasn't. Yeah, if it didn't work. Yeah, exactly. So, but yeah, and and the, yeah, in general, you can answer this question, guys, in the comments, and we would love to hear what you th what, what you think. And also, if you have a favorite from the ones that we show you on the screen, that would also be great if you could if you could hear your picks. So, to answer your question, um, there there's two different types of, of advertising that mm -hmm. you know for me that stands out. One, uh, the first is that. I like, and the second is that I may dislike, but it works nevertheless. Um, the ones that I uh, that I like um, really very much are from the 30s and 40s and so on that have artwork. Basically, these are beautifully hand painted uh, images, and it just it it, it's, it just really gives me like this quality feel and this human touch that a lot of the new ads don't have. It's like a watch, you know, just spinning in black space in the, in the videos and in the pictures. And here, I'm looking at this Gruen uh, Curvex watch, which is a uh, Class C Frank Miller <laughs> from, from the 1940s. <laughs> <laughs> um, and, 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 you know, it's just a handwritten text and it's beautiful and the colors are great and it puts you in a different frame of mind when you look, when you see this. It almost has the, a dolly quality to it with these watches just, you know, just in space and the desert and there's uh, this uh, lady wearing like this uh, you know dress uh, this really nice dress just looking at these watches and it's it's like uh, it's like a parallel universe in a way but I really like it I think it's, it's a very classy ad yeah I like that one as well it, it's very it's very surreal and I think that that speaks to that particular time period where there's a lot of surrealism in art too uh, or look at this one. It's it's Montre Election, and and it's a, and it shows like these super weird like create creations like ladies <laughs> under the water just floating around, and each of them is carrying one of the one of the Roman numerals for the watch, and they are basically they are traveling to the you know to the inside of the watch somehow. This is like in the ocean. It's it's as weird as I describe it, and. Um, but it's an artwork, and I like it for that reason. Or, or this Cordbert ad that just shows a watch dial. This almost has like a Debethune quality to it. It, it shows a watch dial with with a with a moon and the sky, and it's just a beautiful piece of of, of art uh, that just you know has like a brand name on it. So these ones I really like, and the ones that actually work. Like here's one that has no art in it at all, but it shows the the the, uh, the beat up face of Bernie Eccleston, <laughs> the guy who was running for Formula One for a long time, and he got mugged uh, somewhere for his for his hublot, and this actually happened. So the guy you see, you know, like he, he has this huge like purple monocle, and he his face is like really beat up, and the message is it's a quote from him, and it says, "See what people will do for an hublot." Oh yeah. man, this! <laughs> I remember reading some old like threads on on the forums that people hated this ad. But I mean, yeah, you can't well. you can't deny the you can't deny the effectiveness of it. I mean, oh yeah, you have it's this huge. you have this bold image of this like old this white haired guy who just been beat to hell, and I mean it immediately draws you in to figure out what's going on. Yeah, exactly, and and it's a, and of course it says Ublo condemns all forms of violence and racism, <laughs> which is, which of course is it's a good call for them to 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 edit there. But yeah, who else would do this if not freaking Ublo? Right. Who else? Yeah, that's right. That's right. And for you, what what are your favorite types here? You know, I um, one one of my favorites in here, oddly enough, is uh, is actually a, a, the old Breitling um, advertisement for the emergency. And everything about this goes against what you would kind of expect from a lot of modern advertisement. It's very cluttered. It's like there's there's a lot going on. Um, it looks a lot more like a like a popular mechanics article or like a comic strip, essentially. In you know, sort of big bold lettering um, at the top. Which it says, one is Darling. That? Uh, um, it says, Darling, we've ditched in the Atlant in the Antarctic. Can you ring nine nine nine? Which is basically like nine. You know, uh, can you call emergency services for us? Essentially. Um, it's a, kind of a big uh, black and white ad. It looks like it's in the the drive that you sent along. Is it? Is it? Um, yeah. Hold on. <laughs> uh, oh, darling. Yeah, yeah. There okay, now I yep. see. Sorry. Yeah. yeah. So anyway, I really like this because one, it doesn't at first glance it doesn't look like an advertisement. Um, it's kind of an exciting story. There's only one very small picture of the watch in here, but it. It describes in pretty great detail in this sort of infographic comic strip style layout that uh, describes the 
the rescue using this particular watch. There's a long story. Um, there's even a byline on here. This was in the Daily Mail um, in, in 2003. So this actually was an article um, of these two guys who've, uh, who've, who've crashed into the ocean with their, with their helicopter. And then uh, basically what happened is that they had this watch on and, and they were rescued because they had the Breitling watch. So it's, I'm not sure if this is an actual article or it's an advertorial so uh, before advertorials were cool. <laughs> yeah, well, I've, I've, I've wondered about that being both ways because I know Breitling's actually done some really savvy... Um, yeah, placement like this, and they, they've done it with um, with Top Gear, for example. Top Gear, yeah, with Jeremy Clarkson, and uh, they've, I feel like they've they've seeded this particular product in a few different ways because um, you know it's it's interesting enough that it does sort of warrant its own story. Um, this obviously isn't you know explicit advertising per se. Um, if if I could maybe double dip um, one that is explicit advertising, I don't think it was listed. Um, the, the only ad, uh, oh, you do have it in here. The only ad that I've ever actually um, printed out, and there's a, there's a guy on Instagram, I'm going to give him kind of a shameless plug here, but I think, uh, what is it, Ad Patina, I think is his name. Um, mm. The guy basically scours old uh, old magazines looking for cool watch ads, cuts them out. That's um, great. And, uh, and he mails them all over the world. You can, you know, and I, I had him source uh, a vintage Aquatimer ad for me because... I did really like this particular era of IWC advertising. Now, to be fair, like um, it also represented a time in the industry where there was a lot. I mean, this is this is wildly politically uh, incorrect, um, especially um, the as like, like the one as, we're as looking at now. Yeah, there was a, a lot of a lot of problems with his ad, and as you said about the Hublot, um, definitely needed a, a a better editor. I would say. Yeah. Yeah. Um, so what however, it, so, so what oh, it ahead. says here, just so that so that listeners know, this is like a this is an ad of um, of an old IWC Da Vinci with a with a perpetual calendar, and it says with big bold uh, black letters or a white background. It's almost as complicated as a woman, except it's on time. So yeah, yeah go on. I just I just wanted to clarify. No, that's. I mean, you know. Clearly, some some misogyny going on here, and and honestly, that's I, I feel like I've seen there are other variants of this same campaign that yes. some of them that's actually not the worst one. I I wish there I wish are some it, really bad one, uh, really interesting ones. Yeah, I, I, I feel saying. like IWC maybe scrubbed those from Google, so I'm not finding. Um, not the, the, finding the funny thing is, I, I literally I just I was <laughs> I was on a call with the with the CEO of of, of IWC last week, and um, oh, with Christian. Yeah, Christian, and and I and I asked him, what's up? What's up with this? Um, with oh, uh, yeah. I feel like so, this is the Kern era, though, is it not? No, I think this I think this before is before. Kern. This is like the nineties, I think. Oh, got it. Okay. Um, may, maybe maybe part of it is the Kern era, but I, I um, I'm not sure. He was there for like seventeen years. He, yeah, maybe maybe it is the Kern era. I'm, yeah. I'm not sure. You you know that that's something I should know, but I, but I don't know. So anyway, I I was just wondering whatever happened to the engineered for men motto, and that mm. went out mm. a window when the, when they launched the Da Vinci for ladies last year. Oh yeah. Um, because uh, prior to that, in in recent memory at least, IWC has not made a single ladies watch. It was all men's watches, uh, as far as I can tell. Yeah, especially you know like since the the early nineties at least, and I. Quite Quite like that image, to be honest, because um, uh, because you know I don't go to like freaking Victoria's Secret and say why don't you make like uh, underwear <laughs> for me? You know, is it is it only for women? And you know, yes, it is, and people take it for you know it's completely normal. Why would I want like underwear from Victoria's Secret? I don't want. So why would women want an IWC when there's like literally hundreds of other brands happy to take their money mm-hmm, and, and create mm-hmm. something uh, you know that is genuinely for them? And when I was looking at, thinking about this and I was looking at the Da Vinci, I was thinking to myself, this actually looks really close to like a Funk Leaf and Arpels. And I oh, think yeah. the good call would have been to call it a Funk Leaf and Arpels, make finally an, an affordable Funk Leaf watch. And and just sell that, <laughs> and you know how much classier would that have been than throwing out the window this image, this 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 carefully curated image of, of IWC uh, that is engineered for men. And I did find this this slogan somewhere on their website, but it's like they're super quiet about it. And basically, the answer was that yeah, it's kind of coming back, but blah blah. blah. So um, I'm not sure what's going on with that. Well, to- I think I think what it is yeah. is a lot of modern brands are afraid to own a singular identity because 
that alienates a potential customer base. And that's, to me, and to, to kind of dovetail on what you're saying, I also, I mean, I liked this particular time of IWC advertising because um, it it was, one, it was very expressive, but two, it felt like the brand knew who it was, essentially. Uh, and I think that's 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 crucial to, to being able to not just identify who your customer is, but to, to generate brand loyalty is when a <laughs> brand is very confident in itself. And yeah. I think I think we can we can agree that at times like it was maybe a little bit too confident with some of the messaging. But, <laughs> you know, we, but, the, but, the, but the uh, the ad that I had that ad patina source for me, the Aqua Timer one is is just um, it's it's the <laughs> reason so fish swim with their mouths open. It has a picture of the, <laughs> uh, the Aqua Timer. I think it's, it's really great. It's a little bit it's a little bit. A little bit cheeky that's um, amazing it's that's bold. Really good one. there's some really good ones in here one of my favorites is also um there's a is a uh, picture of i think it's the portuguese or maybe <laughs> it looks like a portuguese uh, and it says the last oh. guy to benefit from being in the wrong place at the wrong time was columbus <laughs> which yeah, is exactly. <laughs> it's just you know it's it's clever whoever i mean i i would and this is one thing that i feel like has not been done in the watch industry yet is like who was the ad agency behind these? I mean, I would love to do a little bit of digging. No, in, I, uh, I, well, you think this was I'm done in house? There was, yeah, I wouldn't, I wouldn't be that surprised if it, if it, if it was announced. To be honest, uh, hmm. but but like for example, like like some of these are out of control. Like like the one that says <laughs> our titanium model is tough on women because it's only available for men. <laughs> <laughs> I'm like, oh my god. <laughs> that's 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 yeah. like a that's that's a long gone era of advertising altogether. Right. Not just in watches, but with whatever. And that's very much also. I mean, that's that's not the Mad Men era, but that's that's sort of the Mad Men mentality, I would say. Um, but uh, yeah, I you know, and these are these are done in. There's there's a good number of these in German too. I mean, the the, the there's a immense. To men. <laughs> yeah, exactly. <laughs> Oh, oh man. man. Anyway, I I think no no one can deny um no one can deny that IWC spoke to a very specific type of 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 customer then, but uh the but yeah, you know, I, it's, man. it's yeah, it's it that's cool that that's cool that Christian was able to articulate kind of a little bit uh in terms of where the the brand is the brand is headed. But but I think I mean it could be argued too that it's not so much that it's not so much that the brand manufactures um, watches for everybody now. I, I, I mean, I, I would agree that that Kern's time at the brand um, confused a lot of people because they were just trying to do too too much. They were just trying to do everything. And, it's carpet um, bombing, yeah. Yeah, and I, I think with the, with the stars and with the exactly. Formula One and with the yeah, Mercedes exactly. and with the men and with the pilots and with the with the with the little prince and with the ocean heritage thing and conserv yeah. sorry conversations yeah. so conservation thing. So it's all over the place a little bit. It's true, but uh, you know, once you get this ball rolling, you you just simply cannot stop because it, it just has to keep on growing. That's that's the that's the nature of the beast, unfortunately. Yeah, that's very true. Yeah. So look at these, like like some of these are just really artistic. I, I really like some of these ads. So here's an old Breitling ad, well before the current era, because this is from 1948. <laughs> <laughs> and it says, Breitling offers you a handful of sales arguments, <laughs> which is just cute, right? <laughs> like, it's so on point. And it says, Chronomat, Datora, and Duograph. All Breitling watches are shock protected with ink lock system. And... This actually is like an ad. It's it's not. I don't think it's it's an ad for for salespeople. It's it's an actual ad, and it says you should go to four fifty two Fifth Avenue in New York if you want to go there, and get yourself a Breitling. So, um, yeah, we we've come a long way. Um, uh, to to it, like the crazy not of era of Zenith, which we, we will not go down on that road today. Mm -hmm. But <laughs> just here's this mm -hmm. one, which says, "Whatever does not destroy makes whatever does not destroy me makes me stronger." And this is a Nietzsche quote on a hideous, hideous watch with a mm -hmm. with a pointless ad. So yeah, to me, this this really ad far. represents the and and <laughs> also being kind the of end. on the nose here. <laughs> this ad to me represents the zenith of terrible watch advertising. I mean, it's a fighter pilot, like this hideous looking watch. This this Nietzsche quote. Everything about this is so incongruous and so unrelatable. 
Um, yeah. I mean, we don't we don't see these kinds of ads anymore. I mean, you just you, you don't. I mean, everybody's trying to be aspirational because they're trying to they're trying to tap into what their customer does, not what their customer wants to be. Um, yeah, that's that's a good point. Like like this Rolex that says, "If you were negotiating yeah. here tomorrow, <laughs> you'd wear a Rolex." Those are classic. Yeah, those are classic. Yeah. And some of those, it's, some of those, I yeah. kind of like though. I mean, there's a if you were climbing here, or if you were, you know, and that was that was back when Rolex actually had pretty like gritty people wearing their watches. I would argue. Um, yeah, that particular <laughs> one doesn't doesn't really sing to me because I'm not not negotiating at uh, yeah uh, or the Geneva Palais Convention Royale or whatever. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. La, uh, Palais de, de Nation. There you go. There yeah. You go. Yeah, but if you were, you'd mm-hmm. wear Rolex, mm-hmm. you know, mm-hmm. like all the turds there. So, uh, yeah. You got any advertisements that are maybe not listed here that you've responded to recently? Like brands that you that, that could be congratulated? I'm not sure that anybody does. Congratulated? Any oh, that's Congratulating a good is the wrong mm-hmm. word to ask David, I think. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I, don't, I very rarely <laughs> congratulate brands, to be honest. <laughs> that's a good point, yeah. Um, yeah. Mm, that's a that's a really good question uh honestly of course which is not really very surprising i just i just like what rolex is doing because it's uh it's extremely consistent and and when you think about that you know and the quality of their pictures and their and their messaging and everything it's you know what i really love about what they're doing is the ingredient stuff if you scroll back up just a little bit a little bit a little bit the hands right there They've they've disassembled and they're shooting these incredible macros of just pieces and I love yeah. that I love that one hundred and thirty three thousand likes that's right it's it's Holy artful more. it speaks to the the design and the precision the heritage I mean these are all super iconic elements that are sort of stripped down and put on a pedestal I really really like that. Um, yeah, there's some cool stuff there. You know, to me, it's funny. Um, I follow I follow a lot of um, kind of adventure photographer type characters yeah. on, on Instagram, and um, I you know I, I know the I know the watch has sort of generated a relatively lukewarm reception. I know it's not your favorite, um, but I really like how JLC has marketed the new Polaris. Um, They've done it from like a design standpoint, and they also they enlisted Alex Stroll, who's this really incredible outdoors photographer. And I really, really liked all the stuff that they put together with him because, um, I mean, it was these were really sort of attainable ways of integrating oneself into the the outdoors. It wasn't you know he he's not some he's not like a crazy you know saturation diver. He's not some crazy like Mount Everest guy. I mean, he's a relatively normal guy, but very talented and very creative. Um, and just something between, you know, the, the, the design elements and the sort of, uh, the classic language of the watch itself and his photography meshed really, really well. And they, they, they created some really nice stuff together. Um, I like, I like it when, when, when watch brands partner with people who do, and that, that sounds yes. weird, but, but people That's who are exactly actually right. active, who, who go from one role to the next, from one crazy, one crazy feature film to the next, or from one crazy assignment as a photographer to the other. So uh, that I do appreciate that said, I, and I actually pulled this up not too long ago when we started this conversation. Uh, this is this is an actual quote from Jaeger's communication about the Polaris, and I just I just removed the name and and and, and uh, of the of the product <laughs> and say product. So it says today's man is someone who does it all, always open to oh the new God, and untried. No. He finds surprising and innovative ways to make the most out of his life. How vague is this? For him, it's about the journey, not the destination. Oh my yeah. God! And the experiences along the way. Today's no, I remember, man. That was hold on, in the hold, press hold on. It's, it's 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 just two more. It's two more sentences. Today's man doesn't have a schedule he has to keep. He makes his own plan for his lifestyle. He needs an elegant yet sporty product that can do it all. <laughs> One that keeps up with his active pace. The new insert product name. It's it's so vague. I, I hear I say. It could feasibly be the sales pitch for anything: washing no. machine, car, yeah. online casino. Yeah. It's a creative. It's a creative <laughs> agency mad lib. I mean, <laughs> it's like the the lorem ipsum of of, yeah. of watch advertising. You yeah. know, it's yeah. like. Um, but yeah, yeah that's you, exactly you, you made a you made a really good counterpoint with that guy and 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 with some some of that 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 is what should be pushed, not this not this nonsense. But that to me is the future of advertising. I mean, when you look at all of these types of ads. 
Um, you kind of strip away the the self-explanatory type of stuff, the self-congratulatory messaging, the yes. the ultra hyper focused pointing at your customer. I mean, that's what that JLC description that you just read does everything wrong. I mean, it says. It's not saying today's man. It's saying this is the type of man you are, and it's like I don't. I oh don't, yes. You don't want to be spoken to like that. Yeah, exa- <laughs> like, don't exactly. Exactly. It, it's so irritating. It's unbelievable. Yeah, it's super irritating. And, and and what you say is is another good point that that yeah they should be and they are leaving out whatever that is uh, self explanatory. So if you look at this ad, this zodiac ad of this actually really quite cool zodiac diver from yeah, a thousand like years one. ago. Um, it, it's so much text. It's crazy. It's like mm-hmm. tiny letters and it's mm-hmm. like several mm-hmm. paragraphs and it's like it explains everything and how many jewels because that mattered at the time, I know. Um, but it has a cool and powerful image like some guys in the, like at the bottom of like the ocean <laughs> pulling up some 2,000-year-old vases or, and stuff like that. And of course, they are wearing a Zodiac watch. So, so you have that and now you would just have a full page picture and the picture of the watch and maybe like a, a, a slogan or a motto or something like that and maybe like a wine liner mm-hmm, um, mm-hmm. Of, of the technical details but now here you have half of the page is just the description of the watch it's like a small article yeah. so yeah we are really really moving away but for example like here's this scantily clad woman wearing a rolex and the point is when she goes out to dinner tonight she'll be wearing the same watch as she's wearing when she's in the lake uh, after some scuba diving or something like that so um yeah, we have, we have come a long way. Um, some advertising has stayed as bad as it's ever been, or as weird or as quirky <laughs> as it's ever been. And some are really good, like this this IWC ad. Just to just to read this thing up, the section up. Um, I remember seeing this at so many places, like ten years ago or something like that. It was it was all over the internet. This is mm-hmm. just a rich shot of awards, a guy. I feel like. Yeah, was that? I think it won some yeah. awards. Did it not? Yeah, yeah, I yeah. think it might have done. So basically, these are those who those loops or those um, yeah those loops that you hold on to when you're riding a bus on the airport and you don't want to fall over when you're standing. And th- this hoop, can I call it that, mm-hmm, goes mm-hmm. around your your hand and the and there's a watch cut out of it. So basically, when you're holding it and you you put your hand through it, it's like you're wearing the of the watch or you're trying it on. So that's that's a cute little thing. But this wasn't the only. IWC did some other in, innovative advertisement, yeah. advertising with the big pilots around this same era, and I think it still persists today. But you know, they they sponsor some. I think it's F1, some F1 drivers. Yes. And forgive me, F1 fans. I'm I'm gonna butcher your sport here because I don't know the the major players or much about the sport. They itself, are they are with Mercedes. They, they Mercedes, are with okay. Mercedes. That's yeah. right. Yeah. Um, but they sponsor so all of their sponsored drivers wear. You know, the, the, all the drivers, of course, have to wear these big white gloves or the the big you know the driving gloves. And the IWC drivers wear these big long white gloves. And the big pilot is actually printed on the cuff of the left wrist of the glove, so yep. that in the in cockpit footage or the driver head cam footage as he's driving this car, you know, because oftentimes they they switch cameras for the coverage throughout the race or whatever. They switch coverage to the in cockpit car or the, the in cockpit camera, excuse me. When his hands are on the wheel, you can actually see, you know, when he turns it to certain angles, like the printing of the big pilot watch on, yeah. there you go right there, yeah, in the gloves. So what is it, Lewis, is it Lewis Hamilton? Is Hamilton the driver? God, yeah, Hamilton and right. Bottas, they, they both have that. But it <laughs> actually went away for a couple of couple of races last year. And I was oh, wondering, did, okay. did this end or something like that? Because oh, interesting. I follow Formula One and I, and I and I keep my eye on these things. But but it actually came back. But the, here's the thing. Um, what is it that happened? That was something weird. Hold on. Yeah, this is a good question that someone asked uh, Chris, like uh, the CEO of IWC. Why aren't the, the the technicians in in the in the pit, you know, who are working on the cars, the Formula oh, One yeah. cars, are not wearing an engineer? They are wearing, <laughs> I think, a pilot. And I'm like, that's the dumbest thing ever. Yeah. How come they are not wearing an, an engineer? They, are, I think, they're pushing the big pilot there. Anyway, there are actually some drivers who wear a watch while racing, like an actual watch. So, for example, the, those who were supported by or friends of Richard Mille, they wear Richard Mille for real. So, like, uh, uh, there were some of these some of these times when they crashed, for example, and they were just getting out of the car, and you could see that the watch was still on them. So it was not something like they were wearing it around, you know, like on these PR events or something. They actually wore it while, while driving. Oh wow! Um, and when I was I, I visited McLaren, the Formula One team once and i asked you know like why like are their drivers really wearing them because i just didn't want to believe and they said 
they said um, Alonso does not want to wear his because it's he finds it annoying. So it, it was too thick, and it it just he was just beating up beating it up on the car on the side of the car, and he just didn't wear it. But oh. some other drivers like Felipe Massa and Roman uh, Grosjean. They they actually wear these watches um, okay. while okay. racing, which I think is cool. I think that's a, that's yeah, a cool do. thing. I think so too. Um, it's cooler than wearing it on a print on the side of the glove. But you didn't know they wore it because it's under the glove. But you did know IWC, even though you're not a fan of F1. So who did the better job here? IWC. So good job, <laughs> IWC. Because there that's you. all that matters. There you have it. Yeah. So guys, I think we're gonna wrap this up, and we will come back to you with a different with a separate episode on the SIHH picks and wishes and wants and whatnot. Um, because this is getting long enough. Uh, how about that, Zach? Yeah, I agree. And I think, uh, I mean, I mean, we're kind of assembling a list of questions for JLC and IWC reps at SIHH. So <laughs> this could be a decent, decent place to end this now for talking about advertising and new models for uh, for 2019. But yeah, I would love. I know, I know, it's maybe a little bit more difficult on uh, on iTunes, but. Um, if you're listening on iTunes, uh, head over to a blog to watch. Find this podcast, uh, you know, as it's uploaded in the story form on the site, and uh, and tell us in the comments, you know, ad- has advertising on worked on you or on YouTube? Yeah, of course. Um, we'd love to love to hear from you in terms of um, your thoughts on modern ads, vintage ads, stuff you liked, stuff you've hated, uh, comments on the cast itself. Yeah, I would. I would this is always to me a really interesting open dialogue with with yes. with watch fans because none of us would I mean I I you can hate marketing all you want but none of us would be here if marketing didn't work and uh, implicit or explicit it's always interesting to see how people respond to different messages and a lot of us probably would not have even gotten into watches so it's not just yeah. it's supporting the media and 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 this right. industry but yeah exactly you wouldn't care like for example I, I distinctly remember like the first ad. Uh, that I saw on Eurosport, you know, this major sports channel here, and it showed a Rolex watch. Uh, this was like 10, over 10 years ago. Mm-hmm. And, and and the watch was just turning and, you know, no one was holding it. And there was this <laughs> super macro close-up on the, on, the, on the hand that just would sweep, you know, like with tiny little oh, yeah. jumps. Yeah, yeah. And I was thinking, I, I actually believed, because I, I knew nothing at all about watches at the time, that it was only a Rolex watch that had hands that would go like that oh, because you know uh, here in Hungary you know uh, <laughs> I, I wasn't surrounded by people who had mechanical watches we all had like you know crappy quartz watches so I have never ever seen a mechanical watch before at least not up close or even if I did I wasn't aware I wasn't paying attention to it I always just uh, you know seeing these annoying quartz hands that would go like tick mm-hmm. tick and so I genuinely believe that I would have to get a Rolex watch at some point to see that second hand move like that because I just really like the way it looks um that's i think that's i um it's something interesting of course uh, i should be ashamed of that but like i say i didn't know anything about watches at the time so what do you expect um so thanks everyone for listening to this episode of spending time and yeah by all means please leave your comments we would love to read them and and uh, and engage with you guys there and stay tuned for the next episode where we discuss sih do's and don'ts and (laughs) and a wish list see you guys there thank you great stuff thanks david